Okay. So um, I don't share this often because I'm often talking about breastfeeding. So today I decided to share my pregnancy story. So back in 1999, I ended up pregnant from my boyfriend at the time, and he lived in London. I was 28 years old, living on my own, about to start my master's degree at Columbia University after being accepted to a, a very prestigious fellowship. And I was having a wonderful career in journalism. Um, and then this happened, right? And when I told my parents, my dad cried. Like, he literally cried. And, you know, for to see my dad cry, even though I was, you know, not a teenager, living on my own, but because of the expectations that my family had for me, they had me on a pedestal, so it was always a big fall, right? So my dad cried. So this was way beyond the expectation of my family, and I was excommunicated from the religion that I grew up in, which meant that all of my childhood friends could not speak to me. So I was devastated and alone. Two months later, the phone rings, and my very wonderful boyfriend says, the stress of the situation is too much, and he hung up. I didn't hear from him again until my child was three months old. So I was pretty much on my own during pregnancy and really dealing with the shame of um, disappointing my family, disappointing myself, and battling really with my own self-identity. So on one hand, I had been accepted in this very competitive fellowship, but it was the first time I saw myself as a negative statistic. That hadn't been my experience before. So my sister, who was concerned about me, she said that because of my student status that I may be able to qualify for WIC, that she wanted to make sure that I was eating properly and not like a student. So she said I should go and check it out. So I said, okay. But I'll never forget that humiliating experience of walking into the WIC office on 125th Street in Harlem um, and having that intake interview. I never went back. Meanwhile, the thought of explaining to my very lovely but all white fellows that my child's father had disappeared was a little bit too much for me to bear. So it wasn't just my own shame, but I carried the stereotypes of black men with me, and I didn't want them to think that it was actually true that these things happened. So I hid my truth from them, and they were just great friends, just wonderful people. So I carried a lot with me. This is why I take a deep breath. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> So a month later at the hospital, I still can remember the feeling that I had when the nurse noticed that the father's signature line on my birth certificate was empty. It was definitely my personal bottom. So for me, having this pregnancy experience, breastfeeding was all about how I changed my personal narrative, right? It allowed me to have a commitment that spoke louder than my circumstances. Um, and it allowed my actions as a mother to overcome the initial shame of how I became a mother. So in a world that is so hungry for description, descriptive adjectives and qualifiers, I put breastfeeding in front of mother instead of single and unwed. It's very important to me. So for me, breastfeeding has always been about empowerment. It has always been about that feeling that I had when I was able to replace shame with pride over my commitment to my daughter and helped me to connect with her in ways that I was worried that I wouldn't be able to. This is what breastfeeding meant to me. The benefits were important, but that feeling of accomplishment is really what fueled me. It really helped me overcome even the difficulties I was having when I was breastfeeding. So even though we later reconciled and got married, that's a longer story, um, how I entered motherhood really stuck with me, right? That experience really stuck with me. And I still call my daughter, who's about to turn 16, my victory baby, right? She's my victory baby because I hit my personal bottom and came out with her and because of her, and I became stronger and wiser from the experience. And I found my own resilience in my pregnancy and my breastfeeding experience, and I bring that to my work. So for me, the story of Black Breastfeeding Week is about Kimberly Seals, no hours, right? and the single mother with little support, and really encouraging all black women to push past their circumstances, those social barriers, the cultural barriers, and to feel good about it. And this is how we begin to redefine our circumstances and challenge who they say we are and begin to rewrite our narrative, even as we do the important work of dismantling structural barriers. 
So four years later, when I had my son and a supportive husband, I also saw the power of men in redefining our experience. So I've lived both sides of the equation, which is really important um, for understanding how women can be successful in breastfeeding. So about breast, Black Breastfeeding Week, here's what happened. Fast forward to May 2013, and I wrote this piece about disparities, and maybe we needed a Black Breastfeeding Week. And then people who had read it were emailing me and texting me and saying, are you gonna do a Black Breastfeeding Week? And I hadn't really thought if I was really serious, I was just putting out one of my ideas. And I was sitting um, at the Rose Conference with Kidada, Green, and Anaya, and we were talking about the idea, and we said, let's go for it, right? But even in those initial conversations, our focus was not about benefits. It was really about celebration. We were always focused on empowerment and it being a celebration beyond circumstances, right? Because we understand the circumstances of lives can be anyone's. It was about empowerment, empowerment and using breastfeeding as one lens to change our narrative. So I'm very grateful, and I first have to acknowledge what I call the sister courage of my co-founders, Kirada and Anaya. Every year we spend so much time planning and strategizing. We see Black Breastfeeding Week as our gift to the community and the way that we give back in a very important way to give them a voice and a space to not be a disparity. To not be a disparity, right? Or to be a four decades long statistic or to be a dying baby. That's not what Black Breastfeeding Week is about. So we begin through Black Breastfeeding Week to rewrite our narrative. This narrative out there that says that we don't care about our children, so therefore you don't have to care about our children. The stereotypical Hollywood and media narrative that for years has portrayed black women as perfectly capable and desirable for taking care of other people's children, but somehow incapable of taking care of our own. That's a problem, right? The narrative that often leaves black mothers feeling powerless over our children when we see them being left gunned down in the street. This is what Black Breastfeeding Week is really all about. It's about changing the narrative of doom and gloom for black women. I have to be honest, sometimes the, the disparities talk gets a little heavy, right? Black women constantly being talked about as a problem to be fixed. And so we have to be aware that we focus on our resilience, we focus on our families, we focus on our strength, and how we leverage that to make people feel good and then embrace the breastfeeding message. Now for us to get to critical mass beyond the choir, right? we want to be able to engage others beyond those who are already breastfeeding. We knew that we had to be bigger than breastfeeding. We have to be bigger than breastfeeding. That includes acknowledging social stressors and the important role of our men. So every year we've been bigger than breastfeeding. In fact, our themes have not been breastfeeding specific at all. In year one, we really focused on just creating a social space we had a, um, Twitter, a Twitter chat that was quite successful, and we really just used the hashtag Black Lives Matter, right? Because um, we knew that's what was going on in our community. In year two, we celebrate the black family, and we asked communities to host a local kids' talent show. Bring your kids out, let them dance or sing, show their talent, play the piano. And we used the hashtag Black Fams Rock was year two. And then last year, and um, we used the tagline, our theme was lift every baby, lift every baby. And we created our new signature event, the Baby Lift Up. Now Lift Every Baby takes a cultural nod from the black national anthem, Lift Every Voice and Sing, and a very famous scene from Roots, right? He lifts up the baby and he says, behold, the th only thing greater than yourself. I love that part, right? And so we hosted Baby Lift Ups all across the country and we put the call out. We didn't know what to expect. But we staged the first ever coordinated at the same exact time all across the country baby lift up. We had participation in Detroit. We had one in Brooklyn. We had one in Los Angeles, Atlanta, Charlotte, Pittsburgh, Milwaukee, Memphis, Philadelphia, and Queens, New York. We're very proud. Why was this so powerful? Because we understood the context of the experiences of black families' lives, right? That they had a feeling that they were being, their children were being devalued and undermined in the media and in their experiences and with gun, and being gunned down by police and mysteriously dying in police custody. So while the media mainstream messaging showed a constant attack on black children and black lives, we decided to lift up the youngest among us, right? 
So our theme is constantly rooted in the context of the lived ex experience of black families, and we acknowledge what we're going through. So we know that equity cannot occur in a vacuum, right? We have to be connected to the context of people's actual lives, actual lives, and use that. And the Lift Up theme allowed us to use our Twitter chat to talk about all the ways we lift up our babies, breastfeeding being one of them, but also through early literacy, through music, through healthy food choices, and so much more. Through this, we had some amazing partners who have been with us through Black Breastfeeding Week, um, Ebony.com, Moms Rising, other um, bloggers and Twitter handles who have a big uh, following. So we've been very grateful for that. And because of that, we've had some great results. Our Black Lives Matter chat had over 1.7 million accounts reach, right? Great reach. And it really shows the power of what we can do. Our Lift Every Baby Twitter chat. Is that the next one? Can we go to, there we go. I left Lift Every Baby Twitter chat also. Really amazing reach, right? So the results speak for themselves. And I want to use this as an important community lesson because we've been willing to let breastfeeding fall back to be the secondary message while we use something else as our primary message, right? So we talked about hierarchy of needs, right? And we're not gonna get black people to, or any people to breastfeed if we're not addressing them on their needs level. So we have to be willing to let breastfeeding fall back use a greater touch, as it were, and then we talk about breastfeeding. It's really important. So this greater reach also understands understanding breastfeeding as a social justice issue, right? Breastfeeding, Black Breastfeeding Week is all about the inequities of support. Just like too many communities of color live in f uh, food deserts where they can't easily access healthy fruits and vegetables, we know that too many people of color live in first food deserts where they are struggling to find the support and the sentiment to successfully breastfeed their children. So back in uh, August 2014, I wrote this piece about um, why breastfeeding has everything to do with Ferguson. It was really, it was really um, a difficult time for black mothers, and it was all about breastfeeding being a way that we take a stand for our children. Now since then, breastfeeding has everything to do with Tamir Rice and Sandra Bland and so many of the other names that we've had to say the names, right? We've had to say the names. But Black Breastfeeding Week is also about Flint and about a community whose voice has been oppressed. <laughs> because for us, during Black Breastfeeding Week, we give black families a voice, and they have a voice. So as I wrote in that uh, Ferguson piece, breastfeeding is our living, breathing, lactating, sucking, and nurturing, rallying sign against the norm, a personal protest sign, fist up, breast out. So Black Breastfeeding Week is a revolutionary act. It's a revolutionary act. And we hope it to return to an evolutionary act, something that just happens naturally without any interference or involvement. Now, any revolution is bound to have resistance. And every year, every year, every year, there are scores of people complaining that Black Breastfeeding Week is racist, why do we need Black Breastfeeding Week when there's no White Breastfeeding Week? <laughs> we, we've heard it all, right? When we first started, we never imagined that it would cause such a backlash among white people, never imagined. In our first year, um, there was a post about Black Breastfeeding Week on a very popular mainstream Facebook site that has over 200,000 subscribers, and in less than 24 hours, it had 500 comments and counting, all negative all negatives about Black Breastfeeding Week. It's as if we can't, we can't have anything for ourselves. Anything for us is against you. No, no. Last year, a very large multinational company that makes breast pumps hastily removed their Facebook support for Black Breastfeeding Week after receiving some negative comments on their site. That was regrettable. So there are still clearly many whose privilege blinds them to our ability to create a space for ourselves, right? They are blinded to the racist systems and the inequities in breastfeeding rates and in infant mortality rates in this country in the first place. Black Breastfeeding Week is not racist. It is because of racism that we have Black Breastfeeding Week. <laughs> So 
So just to be clear, I don't explain to anyone why we have a Black Breastfeeding Week. Kidada, Anaya, and I, we don't explain that anymore. We don't explain that. Because ultimately, Black Breastfeeding Week is about self-determination, and it's self-determination without explanation, right? It's without explanation. So if you need that, we've put resources on the website. <laughs> There's a toolkit, some questions. It's there. But we don't explain it anymore. But we certainly do need allies. Black Breastfeeding Week definitely needs allies. Um, and this is really important. Because allyship, first of all, is not you asking one of us to help you respond. I just need to be clear about that, right? That's not what allyship is. You have to take a stand for, for BBW yourself and take a stand for our right to self-determine what our community needs and wants and respond to that, right? Allyship means knowing when others should lead and when you need to fall back and support the lead that others are giving. That's what true allyship is about. Ultimately, for our work, allyship means bringing in communities and, and faith-based organizations and fathers and mothers and policy makers and business owners. It will take all of us to build that bridge to equity and all of us to cross that bridge together. But this revolution will not be individualized. Let's get to work. <laughs> <laughs>